So that was the first sonata. And when we think about Beethoven's remark of looking for a new direction, we find the answer in this second sonata that comes now, which is very well known, rightly so, because it's one of the great masterpieces of all times, the D minor sonata. We call it the Tempest because when Schindler, Beethoven's secretary and biographer, asked Beethoven what he thought of at this sonata, he supposedly had said, read Shakespeare's Tempest. But it is not program music. Like in the pastoral symphony, the subtitle says, uh, Mehr Empfindung als Tonmalerei, more feeling than tone painting. And at least in the pastoral symphony, when we have those bird calls, then we know when it's the lark and the nightingale. We have no such indication in this sonata. So I'm sure you all know The Tempest by Shakespeare. And what a wonderful work that is. But I think it's, it's empty speculation to, to try to find the parallels, what part of the tempest we are talking about and what character. Uh, but it does give an indication about the depth and the whole range of, of this Beethoven sonata. Uh, we are talking about uh, existential and, and metaphysical uh, themes here and subjects. How can you start a stonata like that in 1802? Uh, we are not even on, in the home key. It's, it's, it's on a dominant sixth chord. We will be in D minor, no? So, and the, the first inversion of that. And it's marked Largo. This is again very new, not to start on the tonic and not to start in tempo. There are three different characters and three different tempo indications on the first page already in this sonata. So let me play this again. Also, it's very important that Beethoven writes the word pedal here. This whole harmony must be in pedal. On this chord we had a fermata, and now he writes allegro. It's, it's a new tempo, a new character. It, it indicates urgency. It's also in alla breve, it's in, in cut four times, so you are counting two in a bar. One, two, one, two. And the, on this do, very dissonant chord, he writes adagio, so it's the third tempo. <laughs> and we have a kind of a mini recitativo. Later on, we will see that we have long recitativo passages. That's why in some countries this is called the recitativo sonata, not, not only the tempest. Now, so we had... Largo, Allegro, and Adagio. Adagio is the slowest of these tempi. It's slower than the Largo. And now we go back to the Largo in a very new key. 
fermata and back to allegro. Actually, this is the first time when we feel at home. We, we arrived in, in the D minor, which is the, which is the home key. Uh, now you will hear in the bass this Mannheim rocket type theme. Those of you who have been here from the beginning, the Mannheim rocket is this kind of theme. A triad going upwards to the sky. Uh, or so it's only four notes, but but it's related to those themes. Um, now again, we have to th listen to the orchestral textures because he writes a very thick. Tremolando, as uh, all the strings would be playing. And then this, this pleading, asking, very desperate motif. And it is really way beyond the piano, not just, we should not even think about the instruments of Beethoven's time, but even in today's world, he is thinking in, in orchestral and in philosophical terms. It's not piano anymore. Uh, uh. <laughs> Incredible excitement and agitation. Now, this figure we will see 20 years later in Opus 111. So the, these double slurs and the and diminished seventh chord. Uh, so let me continue. Sounds like a new theme, it is, with the with the Napolitan six chord. But if you, you look at these tones and then think back a few seconds ago, it's the same theme backwards, in retrograde from. So um, this is just a, a detail to show that Beethoven thought very, you know, consciously about music and, and science and mathematics, but, but it's anything but dry science, because you can only get to these things when, when you analyze them, actually. After one hearing and even further listening, you are not, not really aware of them. It's also maybe not so important. The great Donald Francis Tovey said that you can relate anything to anything else, but it's not really relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it's only relevant what you hear. And what you hear is that this is just so... the bass, and um, usually pianists play this section fortissimo, it's a big mistake, 
because it should be sforzando within piano when, when it goes to the bass. It's much more dangerous, it's much more menacing that way. And only the last sforzando is in fortissimo. This one, this is fortissimo. Then it's subito, sudden piano. This is the only D minor sonata of, of Beethoven. There is not another one, not among the violin sonatas, not among the cello sonatas, only this one. And the Ninth Symphony, quite a well-known piece. So, but D minor means something uh, very special. All these composers, uh, they, they were thinking in, in symbols. Uh, each tonality is connected to, to a certain thought. And to me, this, this D minor with Beethoven is something, something existential. Uh, now look what he does here. <laughs> this little bridge motif that takes us back to the repeat of the exposition. Uh, what is this? Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's St. John's Passion, Es ist vollbracht, this wonderful uh, alto aria. And Beethoven knew and loved this and he quotes it here uh, in the A major cello sonata, opus 69. He, uh, on, or in opus 110, the A flat major sonata. So these are not accidental motives. Uh, so but let's go now to the development section. We are back to these these dreamlike arpeggi. If I may say, this, this is very much the world of, of Prospero from the Tempest, the, the dreamy and the, and the philosophical. And so we have this dreamy world and we have the world of reality, which is this one. That's now and in, in reality, in present. The other one is... First time there is a rest written now. Now he modulates much further away. And now comes the most unexpected harmony. Brutally woken up from this dream, back to reality. In F sharp minor, we are very far away from. Uh, yeah. Let me play a little bit more from this section. Uh. Thank you. 
end of the development, a huge storm, and the storm lets off and is tired and stops on the dominant. Now comes the recitativo. The beginning of the sonata, repeated, but now comes again, the pedal is held down and everything swims. Piano and semplice, simply, without too, too much pathos. And again, this is a, could be a monologue of Prospero. Now we come back to the Allegro. Oh, actually, this is, this is the recapitulation but it's, it's something so novel. It's, it's a revolutionary way of writing a recapitulation. Here comes the second recitativo passage in pianissimo. to F minor, we are very, very far from the exit. And how on earth is he going to come back now? This is, I call this the goose pimple spot. <laughs> it's very scary. Um, so, um, this A flat, but then it is enharmonic with the top voice of the following chord. A flat and G sharp, so are enharmonic. Uh, we are in F sharp minor. G minor, that's already the subdominant. And then he reaches the dominant. So let me just play this again because you know it very well, but it's, let's listen to it with fresh ears. Thank you. 
This whole first movement, unlike the previous sonata, when I said this is deliberately very long, this is over in a few seconds, psychologically. It's, it's, everything is so, so concentrated and so short. And because there's something like psychological time, something might seem long and other things seem incredibly short. Uh, like all these great psychological sonatas, the, the movements are connected, so there should really not be a pause between these movements, which will not give anybody a chance to cough. <laughs> Terribly sorry. So we, we finish this first movement, and the second movement starts on the mediant in B-flat major. But you see the connection. The first movement and the second. This is wonderful. This, what an idea just to... Probably he just added this first bar as an afterthought. Like he did, we, we know for sure that in the Hammer Klavier Sonata, uh, slow movement, the first bar was added later. Uh, so after he establishes the tonality here, in the first bar, and now comes his, his wonderful adagio in three, four time. One, two, three, one, two. wonderful dark sonority of violas and celli and deep strings. Uh, again, if motivically, he closed the first movement with... So, F, D is a third, and now is D, F with with the tone in between. So everything is connected. I'm sorry to irritate Mr. Tovi, but they are, these things are to me very important. And so there is this motive of the third played by by a wind instrument like an oboe and the strings answer. So every they are the melody is divided. It's not played by the same instrument. With, with huge dissonances. Um, and it has this wonderful dark color, but an incredible tranquility and calmness. This is really a, a resting place between two storms, two tempests, which are the first and the third movements. Um, Wonderful, like like a timpani roll, brum, 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 and it's everything from from far away. We we have to have like in the visual arts a sense of perspective. It's not near, but far away, and it's wonderful. The, the, and now comes a great chorale.
are always reminded of, of the tempest. Gone away, but it will return. This is one of those moments that to me only, only Beethoven is capable of giving me this, this human warmth. He, he writes Dolce here and we, we have the, in this very philosophical movement some, suddenly something very human and very warm. Uh, also we must think of the, of the rhetoric rhetorical elements of the music, so things that are being spoken and things that are being sung. Now this is a singing part, a singing motive. End of the exposition. In just four bars, a bridge motif that leads us back uh, to the variation of the theme. We have seen in earlier sonatas, like in Opus 26, a sonata of four movements and none of them are in sonata form. Now we have three movements, they are all in sonata form. But this one, this second movement, is without a development section. So, the last movement of this sonata is extraordinary. It's marked allegretto, so really not a fast movement. Unfortunately, it's usually played very, very fast. It's a terrible mistake. Uh, you know, if Beethoven wanted something very fast, we will see in the next sonata, he writes, prestissimo con fuoco, very fast with, with fire but Allegretto is not fast. Unfortunately, our beloved professor Karl Czerny, who was, as we know, one of the great pianists and Beethoven's most famous pupil, and he left us an anecdote that Beethoven wrote this finale of the D minor sonata as he was sitting at his desk and the horseman rode by the window, galloping. Uh, I mean, with due respect, where is the galloping in, in this music? It's a, I don't believe this anecdote, it's a lie. <laughs> uh, when I think of galloping, I think of this kind of music. That's galloping. <laughs> but this one... Uh, it's, it's in 3-8 time and, and it says something melancholic about it, but then you will see it, it, it will be very dramatic and very tempestuous. Um, 
It's also very important that in the first four bars, Beethoven always holds down the second note. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm doing here? So, if the pianist plays these bars with pedal, then this becomes nonsense. So, uh, Then you don't you don't hear the texture what Beethoven read, and then later he indicates where, where the texture changes. He indicates which bars he wants with pedal and which he wants without. So let me try to show that now. From the ninth bar, it's, it's a different concept of sound. Uh, the whole movement is a perpetuum mobile with minor interruptions. So it's the, this whole similar movement goes through the whole piece. Uh, here is a little interruption. <laughs> exclamation marks and with the chromatic scale which is so painful now we come to the second subject which is This is almost manic re repetition of, of this motive of two notes slurred. Again, let's think back to the first movement. So you see how Beethoven, the process of thought is working. Um, then, Sunday on, on the dissonant tones. So, with all the effort I'm making, I cannot hear the gallop and the horseman here. <laughs> Terribly sorry. Um, then the development section again pays homage to Johann Sebastian Bach. Versions and in double counterpoint, like in a Bach invention or fugue. Uh, and then, this is a, a gigantic construction, in sonata form. It's one of those Beethoven sonatas, and here he is a master unparalleled to me, that his last movements are at least as great as the previous ones.
In this case, it's even greater. And so he, he can make the balance of a sonata that almost the, the last movement carries on its back most of the weight. We, also, we feel this very often in later composers with, with the greatest ones, even Schubert, much more with Schumann and Brahms, that always the last movements somehow they fall down. I'm terribly sorry to say this, but that's a fact. Yeah. And, and Beethoven, is, that's why he's, he's a little bit greater than the rest of them, I'm sorry. Because not than his predecessors, because this is never the case with Haydn and Mozart. But, but Beethoven is new in a way that he's writing enormous last movements, which, which carry the weight of the balance of the whole composition. So often the last movement is on, on one side of the scale and the first and second on the other side, and they are in perfect balance. Um, just let's see the end of this sonata. just as unorthodox a way to finish a piece like the beginning was. So it's consistently unorthodox. And we, you heard the, the, the climax of the piece when, when this melancholy theme appears in, in full glory and it's, it's a real, real outburst. And also this, this third exclamation... <laughs> Presentation of, of the deepest despair. So, when this sonata is over, I, I always feel quite shaken, and uh, actually, one should just have a minute of silence after it. Uh, unfortunately, in, in some places, there is always some very clever person in the audience who wants to show, I know this piece, now it's over, and uh, bravo, so, and it is, as much, as much as we, we do appreciate applause, and we are very grateful to it, but you can see that after a moment like this, it's, it's most inappropriate. Now, let me just have a glass of water. Thank you.